encourage you to also please raise your hand and let us know when you're ready to ask questions. Thank you. So first of all, let me introduce this, the, the one, the, this panel here. We have here Mr. Rashad Mohammed Alalimi, Your Excellency, welcome. He is the Chairman, Presidential Leadership Council um, from Yemen. And we have Senator Chris Murphy from the United States of America. He's also a member of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. We have uh, Mr. Abdelaziz uh, Zagar. He's the founder and chairman of the Gulf Research Center from Saudi Arabia. And we have Ms. Hannah Neumann, who's the chair of the delegation for relations with the Arab Peninsula for the Green Party of the European Parliament. Welcome. Your Excellency, maybe we could begin with you. Can you tell us how does the current situation in Red Sea impact the life of Yemenis? بال بان اكون مع هذه الكوكبه من الشخصيات المهتمه بالشؤون اليمنيه ف وايضا تحيه لجميع الحاضرين والحاضرات معنا هنا في القاعه الذين سنشارككم مجموعه من الافكار والتصورات حول الوضع في اليمن والبحر الاحمر طبعا سابدا القصه ب الوضع في اليمن الوضع في اليمن اليوم يشكل كارثة كبرى ليس على اليمنيين فقط ولكن يشكل كارثة أيضا على الإقليم والعالم العالم أفاق اليوم أو خلال الأشهر الماضية على تهديد للملاحة في البحر الأحمر وهذا التهديد نحن عشنا في اليمن وعاشه اليمنيون لفترات طويلة سابقة الميليشيات الحوثية سيطرت على السلطة وفرضت نفسها كأمر واقع وتفاعل المجتمع الإقليمي والدولي مع هذه المشكلة صدرت قرارات من المجتمع الدولي وأهمها القرار 226 وللأسف تعامل المجتمع الدولي مع هذه القضية كأنها قضية أمر واقع وسلطة أمر واقع وتعامل معها كمشكلة سياسية وأنها مرتبطة بالسردية التي روجها الحوثيون وأنصارهم في أماكن كثيرة على أنها فيها مظلومة وأنها فقط تريد أن تشارك في السلطة وخلال المرحلة الماضية كلها ثبت للجميع سواء على المستوى الإقليمي أو الدولي أن هذه الجماعة هي التي لا تريد الشراكة مع الآخرين من خلال عدة معطيات تمت خلال المرحلة الماضية وأهمها كل الاتفاقيات التي تم توقيعها مع هذه الجماعة ولم تلتزم بها وقدمت الحكومة الشرعية التنازلات المتعددة في كل الأوقات لاستيعاب هذه المطالب واستعادة الدولة والدخول في عملية انتخابات حرة ونزيهة وديمقراطية يشارك من خلالها الجميع لكن هذه الجماعة فرضت أمر واقع بقوة السلاح وللأسف لم تعمل القوى الدولية كلها على تنفيذ قرارات الشرعية الدولية خلال هذه المرحلة كلها و صدر القرار 2126 وكان عبارة عن خارطة طريق لحل المشكلة اليمنية ولكن نحن فوجينا من كثير من المهتمين بالقضايا اليمنية والمسؤولين عنها سواء في المنظمات الدولية أو في الدول الغربية أن هذا القرار غير قابل للتطبيق وأن تم تجاوزه وأن هناك واقع آخر وبالتالي هم هذا المجتمع رضخ لمقولة وسرديات الأمر الواقع وسيطرت والسيطرة الميليشية الحوثية الإرهابية على الحكم بقوة السلاح وانتهكت كل القوانين كل القوانين والدستور المحلية وصادرت الممتلكات وارتكبت الكثير من الجرائم في حق اليمنيين والعالم كان يتفرج على اليمنيين حصلت ماساة إنسانية كبيرة لليمنيين خلال هذه المرحلة وكان العالم لا يلتفت إلى هذه الماساة. Still ongoing and no one is paying attention. 
the way the United States of America and uh, the uh, UK government are dealing at the moment with the Houthis. Is that the right way to deal with them from your perspective? The counter the counter yes. uh, I think that the attacks that are going to happen today will not solve the problem. وهذه الضربات انا اعتقد ان انا اعتقد انها لن تزيل التهديد للملاحه الدوليه ولا الهجمات لان التهديد ياتي من البر وليس من البحر وبالتالي انا اعتقد ان الحل المهم والاساسي هو الشراكه مع الحكومه ودعمها لكي تتمكن من استعاده الدوله والسيطره على المناطق التي يسيطر عليها الحوثيين وهكذا يتحقق الأمن الإقليمي والدولي لأنه اليوم الطائرات المسيرة والصواريخ الباليستية التي تأتي من إيران إلى الحوثيين اليوم هي التي تهدد الملاحة في البحر الأحمر وتأتي من البر وليس من السواحل The Red Sea and other coasts Mrs. Hannah Neumann into the conversation because she was in Yemen recently uh, Mrs. Neumann um, his Excellency mentioned that Iran plays a role in the whole situation. How do you see that? I was indeed in Yemen just in December and we left the day that the... Ah, sorry. Oh, for the live stream. Um, I was indeed in Yemen in December and visiting Aden and we left the day that the Prosperity Guardian mission started. And I think it is important that the European Union that will now also join with the mission and we do something against this blackmailing of the Houthis in the Red Sea. But we also have to deal with the longer term issues and the root causes, and here I would mention two. First of all, it is quite clear Iran, the Iranian regime, is fueling this escalation. The intelligence on which ships should be attacked is coming from Iran. The equipment to attack the ships is coming from Iran. And it is clearly in Iran's interest to stir confusion and escalation in the region as a whole. So without dealing with Iran, we will run into these situations again and again. And the second issue is the inner Yemeni peace process that is currently on hold again. Um, there were some hopes um, that it could be transferred to the UN. I'm sure Hans Grunberg himself can speak better about that. And now with this escalation in the Red Sea, it's difficult again, yet we need to address that in the medium and long term. And not all the attention can go on this escalation. And allow me one last remark regarding the Houthis. They claim to do these attacks in the Red Sea to support the children in Palestine. Mm -hmm. At the same time, half of the Yemeni population, half of the children in Yemen are malnourished. And this has a lot to do with the policies of the Houthis. Senator, may I ask you, do you agree that the um, real issue is actually Iran here? And um, is the way the US government and the UK are treating the situation at the moment the right way, in your opinion? Well, there is no doubt that Iran is behind these attacks. As I said, the intelligence, but also the equipment, um, comes directly from Tehran. Um, listen, the United States uh, is not going to stand by while the freedom of navigation is interrupted, and U.S. assets transiting through the Red Sea are being attacked. Um, we. Um, have obviously launched an unprecedented response that we believe over time will downgrade the ability of the Houthis to be able to engage in these acts of piracy. Um, but I do think it's important to sort of understand the context. Um, there are many of us in the United States Congress that were deeply opposed to the U.S. participation in the uh, conflict in Yemen. Uh, our participation ran through the Saudis. Our worry was that by engaging in that conflict, we would extend it, and the extension of that conflict would end up um, giving more influence and more involvement to the Iranians inside Yemen, inside the Houthi infrastructure. Uh, and so I think we are seeing now the consequence of a war that lasted far too long. 
Um, Iran may not have command and control of the Houthis as they do with some of their other proxies in the region, but there is no doubt they are more deeply integrated today than they were at the beginning of this latest iteration uh, of the war. So the United States will you know, continue to uh, engage in this response effort. I, I do not think there is an appetite in the United States for us to be part of a coalition that would do more than uh, strike from uh, the sea and the air. Uh, but we believe uh, over time this can have a deterrent effect. I just have to ask you to, to make sure we understood fully that uh, is it that you say, Senator, that the war um, which uh, the Saudi-led coalition had uh, against the Houthis is responsible for what we are seeing today, that the Houthis became stronger, in fact. Is, is that what you're saying? No, well, listen, no, no one bears responsibility for what is happening today aside from the Houthis and their sponsors in Tehran, period, stop. All I'm saying is that you need to understand the context, and there is no doubt that the um, relationship and the level of integration between Iran and the Houthis uh, increased over the course of that long war. It was one of the, the warnings that many of us gave who were <laughs> opposing U.S. participation in the war. That is not a means of shifting blame. Uh, I think that is, to me, just a recognition of reality. Uh, Dr. Abdel Aziz al um, Saudi Arabia, in fact, had um, quite a experience with actually the Houthis for many years, uh, the war. Um, what advice would you give the U.S. and U.K. governments today um, how to deal with the situation? What would be the right way to deal with it? Thank you, Suad. I'm glad to be here. Uh, let me start by saying the Red Sea used to be a quiet corridor with no uh, much activity going on in terms of terrorist attack or in terms of disturbance. Until the Israeli and the Iranian start targeting each other, then it became a very well disturbed. Uh, and the Red Sea in both sides, the Suez in the north and the Bab al Mandeb in the south. To link what the Houthi have done against or launching their rocket or their missiles uh, to tell Abib and link it to the Gaza situation is a big mistake for two reasons. It did not start today. It's, it's already since nine years. They're attacking vessels. They have their uh, uh, fast boat. They did piracies. They have done terrorist attack. And we have been saying this from day one. In 2018, when the coalition forces, they were close to gain Hudaida. The British and the Americans said, no, you should not. This is a red line. This will have an impact on the humanitarian situation on the Yemeni. So you should not do, you should not move. Why we did not join the prosperity uh, forces? I think there are very clear reasons. Number one, we believe there is an international sea law, 1981, and this would have required a Security Council resolution instead of an individual country raising uh, uh, the sort of coalition uh, like what the U.S. have proposed. Second, uh, there is a serious negotiation between the legitimate government and the Houthi, that Saudi, with the support of the U.N. Uh, special envoy, uh, coordinating uh, the issues, which first has to deal with the uh, hostages, the prisoner of war, and all these uh, uh, huge numbers. Um, but at the same time, so we thought that, you know, we did not want to disturb any uh, uh, you know, issue related to that. Third, I don't think the U.S. and even the new European naval capability that they are looking for a Saudi or UAE naval capabilities to, to support their presence there. They have all the majority of the capability. What they need is the legitimacy of the act. And fourth, we do believe in the region, particularly the GCC country in total, in Saudi Arabia and UAE, since they are part of the coalition, that having a diplomatic talks may result into a better answer. However, if you look at all the U.S. and the British attack, it was targeting a naval capability the Houthi possess. And most of that capability, he, he took it from the Iranian side. As uh, Dr. Hanashi said here and the senator, the information coming from Iran, Satellite images coming from there, the missiles coming from Iran. So the triangle that has to do with the source of the weapon, the logistic and the route, 
the launching uh, platform and the storage. What the U.S. did target in the British is the storage and the launching, you see, and lately some of the uh, uh, supply chain, but not the main source that coming from Iran because in no way the U.S. will involve in, uh, at least for the time being, in, in targeting the source that which is coming from Iran. So dealing with that issue, it's a bit, uh, a bit of a complex, but you can see that a free country in the region or in the Red Sea, they have suffered a lot. Egypt have lost 40% of their income. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia and the Yemeni in general, by the way, they are the biggest loser because even the agreement they made between the Houthi and the Chinese not to attack any Chinese vessels, it did not work. It worked only to stop the attack on the vessel, but it did not help to reduce the prices, the cost of shipping and the insurance and so So the Yemeni also are suffering from that one. So are you saying, in other words, if you would have to advise the US and UK government, you would advise them to attack Iran? No, so I will advise them take go go to the deep root in the Houthi side. There. Don't accept a violent then state actor that who took over the government and through the legitimate government and legitimize their act on the basis of what His Excellency have said, the Al-Amr al waqa Siyasat Al-Amr al waqa the reality on the ground, and accept that terminology and deal with it. This is a violent non-state actor. If we accept this notion, where do we stop? Do we stop in ISIS in Iraq, or do we stop on the on the, on the uh, Ahrar al-Sham in Syria, or do we stop in Hezbollah in Lebanon? Where do we stop with that one? So, Actually, Hannah Norman, since you were the one who brought Iran into this discussion, also with its excellency, I will come back to you in a moment. Mm -hmm. What should the European Union, what should actually the West do here in terms of Iran, vis-a-vis -vis Iran? It's easy to sound smart up here. Um, and what we can learn from the Saudi experience in Yemen also is that bombing Yemen is not going to do any good and is not going to help with anything. So, so what indeed, is? going to the root cause and Iran and... <laughs> I would say let's start with being as clear in our rhetoric and politics vis-a-vis -vis Iraq, vis-a-vis -vis Iran, as we are with Russia, because they are joining forces. They are also joining forces in this case, um, and we should check if, especially the. Especially in Germany, um, it took us a long time to fully acknowledge how dangerous it is what Russia is doing, although the neighbors of Russia have been warning us and telling us. And some of that reminds me of the situation with Iran right now, where for years and years the neighbors have told us how toxic and how difficult it is. And because we thought there would be stability, if only we are not too outspoken, uh, we haven't been as clear, we haven't been clear enough. And now we don't even have regional stability. And let's not talk about the situation of people inside Iran. Um, they are all suffering from this regime. I understand, but the question is, what should be done? So you, you, you say it should be clear, more words, more rhetor rhetoric, from what I understood. Is that what you also agree with, uh, Your Excellency? Or would you say the, the world would have to go a step further and maybe use force. I think that the Iranians are not with the diplomacy or with the people of the world. The world has with the Iran. Now, 40 years ago, والعالم يمارس هذا الأسلوب الدبلوماسي والناعم مع إيران نحن نريد أن نقول للعالم اليوم أن الترضية لهذه الجماعات الميليشية الإرهابية المدعومة من إيران كلما منحتها حوافز وأرضيتها كلما طالبت بمزيد من المكاسب وهذه تجربتنا نحن في اليمن مع الحوثيين ومع إيران كلما أعطيناهم تنازل في إطار حرصنا على تحقيق السلام والأمن والاستقرار لليمنيين وللمنطقة كلما ازدادوا طلبا لمزيد من المكاسب والدليل على ذلك اتفاقية ستوكهولم 
اتفاقية ستوكهولم الحديد اليوم الذي هي الميناء الرئيسي والذي تنطلق منها الصواريخ والمسيرات وتأتي إليها أيضا الأسلحة الإيرانية كانت الحكومة الشرعية على وشك السيطرة عليها وكان لا تبعد الميناء إلا ثلاثة كيلو عن القوات الشرعية وتدخل المجتمع الدولي بكل قواه وأوقف هذه العملية ولأسباب إنسانية اليوم وين الوضع الإنساني في اليمن؟ الوضع الإنساني أسوأ بكثير مما كان عليه لو سيطرت الحكومة الشرعية على هذه المناطق وبالتالي أنا أعتقد أنه أسلوب الترضية وأسلوب المداهنة وأسلوب التماهي مع سلطات الأمر المواقع والميليشيات التي تخدم بالوكالة إيران في المنطقة أنا أعتقد هذا أسلوب ثبت لنا نحن بالنسبة لنا في اليمن كتجربة أنه أسلوب لا يؤدي إلى نتائج وإنما يؤدي إلى مزيد من تكريس الأمر الواقع ومزيد من السيطرة الإيرانية والدليل ما نشهده اليوم في البحر الأحمر البحر الأحمر خططت له إيران من وقت مبكر وكان عندها استراتيجية للسيطرة على البحر الأحمر من وقت مبكر و سيطرت على على البحر الاحمر وباب المندب وكان هو حلم استراتيجي بالنسبه لايران والدليل على ذلك ان ايران اعلنت ان البحر الاحمر اصبح بحيره ايرانيه واليوم نحن لا نتحدث عن متى سيتوقف هل هو له علاقه بغزه او ما لهش علاقه بغزه المساله اعمق بكثير طالما بقيت هذه الميليشيات مدعومه من ايران طالما بقي السلاح يتدفق إليها من إيران ستظل تهدد الملاحة في البحر الأحمر وربما تبتز في أوقات قادمة مناطق أخرى. So, um, Senator, before I open the floor to questions here from the audience, uh, I would like to ask you what should um, the West do to also ensure that the humanitarian situation inside Yemen is not getting worse with all that's happening or what can be done from your perspective? Well, uh, let me quickly answer that question, but I, I do want to weigh in for a moment on yeah. your, your very correct question about what do we do beyond rhetoric, what is our actual policy moving forward on Iran. Um, so as you know, uh, the United States did move forward with a new uh, terrorist designation for the Houthis that was um, postponed for a period of time so that we can take steps to assure that humanitarian aid is still allowed into the country. Um, very clearly, this is a moment where the United States has to dramatically increase its contribution to humanitarian aid writ large. Um, the legislation that the United States Senate just considered, which was best known for funding the war in Ukraine, also included billions in new humanitarian uh, assistance. Um, and I would hope our partners in the Gulf will do the same. It has been very difficult at times to uh, try to convince some of our friends in the Gulf to help put significant dollars. Uh, many have been generous, but uh, the dollars have been at times um, uh, far too intermittent. Uh, and so working with our friends in the region is important. Um, on this question of Iran for just one moment, listen, you have two paths. You have an escalatory path and you have a de-escalatory path. Um, I support the decision of the Biden administration to launch significant attacks against Iranian proxies. And I think it is important to know that since uh, those attacks were launched, we have not seen um, our forces at risk in the way that they were prior to these attacks. But there is not an appetite in the United States of America to go to war with Iran. There is not. And it is important to note that during the period of time when the JCPOA, the nuclear agreement, was operational, we saw no attacks by Iranian proxies on U.S. forces in the region. In fact, during that time, we were working with the Iranians in our efforts to attack and defeat ISIS. Um, I understand the Iranians. Uh, my eyes are wide open. Um, but uh, this is not a moment to engage in a new diplomatic push, given their connection to the events in Gaza and their sponsorship of the attacks on us in the Red Sea. Um, but I just think it's important for everyone here to understand that um, in the United States, while there is support for these targeted attacks, there is not going to be support for a conventional engagement in Yemen. Uh, or against Iran. And so if that's the case, then you have to make a decision. Are you pursuing a escalatory path that has a cap? What's the efficacy of that? Or are you going to pursue, when the time is right, 
a de-escalatory and diplomatic path. So I would like to give both of you, uh, Dr. Abdelaziz and uh, Ms. Norman, um, one minute to answer or to comment on this, and then I would like to open uh, to the audience. Yes. There is 165 attack against U.S. facility, presence, camps, airport, people since 7th of October. So the, the, the arms of the Iranian are not going to be quiet. They will continue to do what they thought they wanted to do. How the U.S. would respond selectively, and the, I'm, I'm using the word selective target, selective attack, selective surgical attack, this is what they are doing. We are moving toward what we call an intelligence warfare. You target one thing, I target another thing, but at the same time, this will not bring the region to, to, to a quiet uh, a peace, particularly if the U.S. administration decide to withdraw from Iraq and Syria. This will create a larger vacuum and will allow much more stronger Iranian presence in the region that we do not wish to see that happening. Just one last comment on the, on the Gaza issue. When the Houthi claim they launch all their rocket and missile for Gaza, that's nonsense in my opinion, because things, as I have said, started before. However, they wanted to gain a nationalistic momentum, whether in Yemen or outside Yemen, to say, look, at, we are trying to fight or to, to, to resist at that one. Fine, but look at the damage they did to their own people in the country, to the whole security of the region, to the changes of the, the, the geopolitical situation that is taking place. Hannah, one minute, please, and then the audience. I don't think we should accept that there is either diplomacy with the regime or bombing pathway when we deal with Iran. There is something else. And it starts with us acknowledging that what we tried in the past, which was either we're going to sweet talk them or we're going to bomb their proxies, didn't work, and now we need to find a new pathway. And the way how we get there, no one's going to have that silver, that, that, that beautiful answer ready, but we need to start the discussion. The discussion starts with saying what we did in the past doesn't work. And then we need to have that discussion with the Iranians that want to see a democratic Iran. And they are there. They are in the diaspora. They are in the country. We have the channels. We should no longer accept that it's the regime that we deal with when we talk about Iran policy. We have to deal and talk with and involve the Iranians that want to see a democratic country. And this time, we have to do it together with the neighbors, especially the Gulf countries who are asking us to have this discussion And together. in the end, you believe this will help also the Yemenis? Just to bring it back well, to our panel, well, yes, and our, sure. because this Definitely. is not an Iran panel, I would like to actually invite before uh, the questions the um, uh, uh, UN representative uh, to Yemen, the envoy to Yemen, please, uh, to make a comment. Uh, Hans Grunberg, if you don't mind. Thank That's you very much. <laughs> I can see. I can see this was. I, I represent uh, the whole world. <laughs> uh, with that said, no, thank you. Thank you. It's been fascinating to listen to this, and and I, I, um, I don't uh, want to to interfere in this. I, I uh, the the couple of points that I want to make from where I sit is basically some just factual observations. One is that I think it goes without saying that we've seen a gradual destabilization in the Middle East ever since the 7th of October. Uh, and that has brought up and it has affected the uh, quite num numerous conflict lines that exist in the Middle East and, and is having an effect on, on them uh, on a broader level. And, and that is also uh, one of the reasons why we see these resurgence of, of uh, and a difficulty in trying to capture the, the essence of, of what we're trying to deal with because it's, it's so complex and it's interlinked. And that once you want to deal with one issue, you have to deal with, with another. And I'm not entering into saying what the narrative is, which narrative is right. I'm just saying that the interlinkages are there and are affecting each other. So from that point of view and from where I sit, and you will have seen me in the Security Council a couple of days back, uh, it's clear that, that the uh, efforts that uh, I have been engaging on together with all Yemeni sides, together with the international community, and the progress that we have seen uh, in Yemen uh, for the last uh, two years, uh, and also the, the serious uh, way forward that we've seen in, in, in attempts to try to, to achieve a, a longer-term settlement of the conflict in Yemen is, uh, at this fragile moment, becoming more difficult to, to achieve. However, 
I, uh, as a representative of the United Nations, will be the one that will always, and not only because I'm paid to do so, but because I am uh, a firm believer in that, believe in a negotiated and mediated settlement of all the issues that we're talking about. So from that point of view, and that is also based in terms of the, uh, the points that are made in the Security Council, is that we all have a collective effort to make sure that we work towards the de-escalation in the region, that we work for, towards the de-escalation in the Red Sea, and that we also safeguard the progress that has been done in Yemen so that we are able to, to move the, 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 the efforts forward in terms of settling the conflict in a country that has been marred by, a, by, by war for such a long time. I remain I'm a firm believer that we will, re we will achieve results in that, in that regard. However, the situation obviously more complicated than than uh, than before, but I'm uh, I'm still uh, I'm still uh, feeling a, a great level of collective support from the international community uh, and also from the Yemenis themselves in terms of that that is the right way forward. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Um, on that note, I would like to open. Uh, please, uh, who would like to ask a question? Maybe you can begin here. Would you please introduce yourself and ask uh, uh, and tell us who you asked the question to? But please, a question. Uh, yes, Anita yeah. Weber. I'm the EU Special Representative for the Horn of Africa, and it's less a question, but I'd like to come back to the spotlight on the Red Sea because um, I think when I'm looking at the Red Sea, I'm, I'm also looking at the Horn of Africa. And of course, uh, looking at the other side of the shore of the Red Sea, uh, where we basically have between Egypt and Djibouti hardly any uh, strong, stable country that is, you know, that is that that could guarantee more uh, security on the Red Sea. I think we cannot we cannot leave uh, that side of the Red Sea out, including to this. Of course, is now, you know, uh, um, a war in Sudan that is not just uh, leading to a state collapse, but where one side is now reaching out to Iran uh, to get to get arms and ammunition. And I think this is an additional problem for heating up the Red Sea, and I believe very strongly a that we need to look at the Red Sea as a regional, from a regional perspective, connecting the two sides. And uh, maybe second, my second point on Aspides, on, on our EU mission, um, I think that what is quite important is that the mission is not just a mission on the Red Sea, but that is very closely connected to you know, the politics uh, of the littoral states mm -hmm. and, and the regional issues that cannot be disconnected from, uh, from the security in the Red Sea. But thank you very much for, thank for you. this. Any questions, please? Uh, maybe you can pass on the microphone to... Oh, yeah. Well, then, and you. then we go to this gentleman there and the lady. Uh, I have a comment. Please, can you this introduce is, yourself? Yeah, my Abtissam al Kitbi. I'm a founder and president of Emirates Policy Center in Abu Dhabi. Uh, the a main question? point now, it's yeah. not a question, it's a comment, that Houthi is a non-state actor. And how can you uh, fight non-state actor with an actor, you need to, and U.S. and U.K., they don't have strategy. You need to have a, a, a special force. How can you fight non-state actor? You couldn't defeat uh, ISIS. The other thing, first, you have to dry Houthi resources economically. Okay, there's Shabwa, there's, uh, where, where is he's taking uh, his economic uh, resources. And the other, where is the arm is coming? This is how you have the uh, holistic uh, strategy. Now, regarding the European mission, how can you safeguard your, your ships? The missiles, you don't have ability. And that's the last question, because yeah. we have some and, other... And, and uh, at, the, at the end, you need to go to the U.S. So Actually, you uh, asked saving... three questions. We will, I will actually... I think you did ask three questions, actually. No, no, it's not a question. It is. It's, 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 it's <laughs> and a I would need to, to because of the how time, to go I, would, from that situation I would need to pass to, it on to other people. Uh, uh, because, yes, yes. But, sure. but, but before, I, before I let you answer that, maybe we can have one more person and uh, give the questions back to the round and come to you. Please. Yes, please. سمعت السناتور بيرمان شوي قال انه ليس هناك اي رغبه في صوت هو بيتكلم بالعربيه ايوه بس الصوت ايه ايه الصوت ما في صوت الصوت ما في 
Okay, sorry, it's on now. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll be Arabi Ali Rais Rashad Al Alimi. Uh Hadrtek Samat Senator Murphy Min Mundu Khalil Kal and Laysa Unaka Aya Ragba Filwilet Mutahida Fim Fi Harb Ma Iran, Amwajaha, Askaria Ma Iran. Well I can Aidan Halif Kumir Raisi as Al Mamlak Al Arabia Saudiya La Turid Aya Mwajaha Ma Iran. In fact, عند تفاهم حاليا مع مع إيران وعند تفاهم مع الحوثيين أيضا فكيف ممكن يعني نحقق رغبتك في ظل موقف في المملكة شكرا. and I would like you to answer first and then yeah. please yeah. أولا أنا أعتقد إنه أننا لسنا دعاة حرب يجب أن يكون واضح نحن لسنا دعاة حرب على الإطلاق. ومنذ تشكل مجلس القيادة الرئاسي أعلنا أننا مجلس سلام وليس مجلس حرب وتعاطينا مع المبعوث الأممي وشجعنا جهوده لتعجيز الأمن والاستقرار والوصول إلى حل شامل وعادل للقضية اليمنية المسألة بالنسبة لنا لسنا نحن دعاة الحرب نحن ندعو إلى السلام ولكن للأسف لا إيران تريد السلام في المنطقة ولا أذنابها في المنطقة واليوم نحن لدينا مشروعين في المنطقة يجب أن يكون واضح للجميع هناك مشروع سلام سواء في اليمن أو في حل الدولتين في إطار تقرير المصير للفلسطينيين ولكن هناك مشروع آخر وهو مشروع تدميري وفوضوي تقوده إيران في المنطقة ونحن نموذج في اليمن نموذج صارخ لهذا للحرب الوكالة والقرصنة اليوم اللي بيتم من قبل الحوثيين هي ليست قرصنة بالمفهوم كما هو في الصومال أربعة أو خمسة يطلعوا على سفينة ويختطفوها ويطالبوا بفدية القضية أعمق بكثير اليوم في حرب تقودها بالوكالة عن الإيرانيين الجماعة الحوثية الإرهابية بالصواريخ والمسيرات والقوات الأمريكية في الأسابع الماضية ضبطت كميات كبيرة من الأسلحة منها غواصات وقوارب قوارب على شكل غواصة لا تطفو على لا تطفو على على البحر. وبالتالي أنا أعتقد إنه ليس هناك تناقض على الإطلاق نحن نريد مزيد من الضغوط على إيران. تمام ضغوط دولية على إيران على أذنابها في المنطقة لكي بالنسبة لنا في اليمن لكي يستجيبوا فقط لعملية السلام والذي ما ي... والذي لا يريد أن يقوله المبعوث الأممي وهو موجود اليوم أنهم رفضوا استقباله في صنع هذه الميليشيات رفضوا استقباله في صنع. So so can would you allow your excellency that we take actually two or three more questions and bring it back to the panel so the audience has a chance. I think there were please the lady up there if you don't mind and then the gentleman in front. Thank you so much. Um, Mina al Rabi, editor of The National. Um, I have a question uh, to you, Senator Murphy. You painted a picture and you said when we had the JCPOA, when uh, the um, P5 plus one had a deal with the Iranians on uh, the JCPOA, then there were no direct attacks on American troops. However, in that time, Iran was building its capabilities and also the militia groups which it supported wreaked havoc in the region. So do you not see that as a problem? Is it fine that if American troops are not being targeted, then it's not a problem? And that is, as we see now in the Red Sea, something that can be sparked off at any point. So how do you make that calculation? And if I may, Hannah Newman, if you could please answer a question about the concerns on the nuclear program of Iran. While it's not directly related to the Red Sea, we're also seeing how some of these capabilities can change the equation in the region completely. Thank you. Maybe we can have one more question and then bring it back to the panel, if you don't mind. The gentleman, I think you were asked. Thank you. I'm Gideon Kutz, uh, uh, working for the Israeli newspaper Ma'ariv and for the Jewish press. I'm also a professor at Paris 8 University. Uh, I, uh, following the way you answered that uh, your government uh, is uh, for uh, to state solution uh, for, and following the optimism of uh, Secretary Blinken today that uh, an initiative, uh, uh, a peace initiative would be possible after resolving uh, the, 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 the Gaza problem, uh, would, you, would you join such an initiative with other, uh, other uh, Arab countries uh, to uh, recognize uh, Israel and to have a, to have a, 
relations with Israel, of course, uh, under the conditions of uh, uh, so, uh, uh, Palestinian problem solution. And then, before we bring it back to the panel, this young man, but if you could be brief, please. Thank, Thank you. you. This is Bashar Al-Halabi from Argus Media. A quick question for the European uh, reps uh, in the room. Um, I mean, this is the first time, not the first time, but we're hearing tougher rhetoric, at least from your side, towards uh, Iran in general, um, and regarding uh, security in the Red Sea. There's an operation uh, for EU naval assets in the, around the Horn of Africa. It's called Operation Atlanta, which is responsible for the safety of the Horn of Africa. What's the future of this force, and uh, will it be deployed in the Red Sea to counter Houthi attacks, for example? So I would like Hannah Neumann to answer first, then the senator and... And you, Your Excellency, the last question, please. Thank you so much. And I start with the very um, concrete um, questions. Um, so first of all, the tougher language on Iran um, has been coming, at least for me, for quite a while. I would even say from the whole of the European Parliament um, for quite a while. Um, and we are trying to push um, other actors of the European sphere uh, in this direction. Um, with um, the mission, so there is indeed the mission Atalanta, and there was some discussion when the Prosperity Guardian mission was launched, whether Atalanta could join, and we made the decision that we will send a very special mission only to contain the violence in the Red Sea. It's called Aspidus. Um, uh, Ms. Weber has mentioned it, um, and it will be operational, I think, in a week to go with um, three fragats that are um, very robustly armed to defend themselves and um, to defend the ships that they are guarding um, safely. Um, on the nuclear program, um, here again, um, I think everyone is very worried because we know that um, the capacity of Iran has been raising to develop a nuclear bomb and the JCPOA, which is the framework to which everyone in theory still holds on, is not working. Um, the chief of IAEA, uh, IAEA, so who's observing all of that, said it's an empty shell. <coughs> Biden said not publicly that it's dead. Um, the Iranian regime walked away twice. So we need to look for a new way, and there is no way we can do that without the Gulf countries who feel most threatened, of course, um, if Iran is moving closer to the bomb. So brings me to Senator Murphy. Uh, would you answer, please, the questions of Ms. al Well, with, 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 with all due respect, the JCPOA was working for its intended purposes before the Trump administration canceled the agreement. So, uh, so I think it's, it's, it's important to understand um, how we got to the place we are today. Um, listen, the United States obviously has important interests in the Middle East, but that does not mean every problem in the Middle East is a United States problem. I would argue that the question of who controls Yemen, at least prior to the attacks against our shipping interests, was not a core U.S. national security concern. Um, not that we didn't have a stake in that, but we should not have been playing such an active role in the military campaign, um, which ultimately did not help the people of Yemen in the long run. As to whether the JCPOA solves all the problems in the region, of course it does not, right? It, we identified core U.S. concerns, one being stopping Iran from getting a nuclear weapon in the short run, and two, protecting our forces. We also believed that by assembling this unprecedented coalition, which included not just Europe, but the Chinese and the Russians, around the implementation of the JCPOA, we had an opportunity to use that coalition to then attack the other malevolent behaviors of Iran in the region, whether it be support for proxies or their ballistic missile program. We never got the opportunity to engage in that second set of work because President Trump pulled us out of the agreement. So, no, I don't overhype the impact of that agreement, but I do stand by the fact that uh, it was working for its intended purposes, it had an important de-escalatory impact, and it had the potential to allow us to assemble and use a coalition uh, to try to ratchet down Iran's other bad behavior in the region. So the organizers say we have two more minutes. Dr. Abdelaziz, can I just ask you one quick question, and then I would like to give the, His Excellency the last word. But are you optimistic or pessimistic after what you hear, what you heard here? I, and then I will, yeah, give you the last word to answer. That. <laughs> 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 optimistic or not? Optimistic? Right. Yeah. Well, no. I think I think there are three steps the U.S. they went through. 
deterrent, defensive, and then offensive. The deterrent Houthi did not listen to that, and they felt you know they they don't care about it. And then they went to the defense. They were trying to respond to the attack that they received. And the third step, they went for offensive, targeting the naval capability that was representing the threat. Am I optimistic? Or no, no, I don't think I'm optimistic. As long as they have the means and the tools, and the source of supply remains, uh, you know, there and, and remains uh, floating to them. Is, uh, Your Excellency. There was a question whether you would recognize or join the Abraham Accords. Um, maybe you could answer that briefly and then uh, tell us what you think of the whole conversation here. Thank you very much for the question. First of all, we are a member of the Arab Association. And the Arab Association has been in the agreement of the Arab Association to solve the Palestinian issue. ونحن ملتزمين في الحكومة اليمنية بهذه المبادرة العربية التي نعتقد أنها هي الطريق والأمثل لحل القضية الفلسطينية هذا فيما يتعلق بالجواب على السؤال فيما, فيما يتعلق بالجلسة الختامية نص دقيقة فيما يتعلق بالجلسة أنا, أنا أتفق على أن هناك التعامل مع الحوثيين يحتاج إلى ثلاث قضايا رئيسية القضية الأولى هي مسائل الهجمات اللي بتتم والعمليات الدفاعية والعمليات الهجومية هذه يمكن تحد من قدرات الحوثيين صحيح <تصفيق>